Julio Panavides, I'm the course instructor for our A445 spacecraft detail design. My co-instructor for this course is Dr. Angela Beck. I'd like to thank everybody for coming in today and all the panelists that are here who are going to be uh, critiquing our presentation and they will be introducing themselves at this time. Hi, my name is Kyle Little and I graduated here in 2004 with Julio. <laughs> Um, I worked, I was in Air Force for a little while, then worked for Lockheed Martin, and currently I'm down in Phoenix working for NSS Aerospace doing flight control systems. My name is uh, Josh Johnson, I work with the Air Force Test Center in the avionics test lead for KC-46 up in Seattle. My name is Ashley Allman, I work for Oceaneering Space Systems down in Houston, Texas, where NASA I'm Jacob Alder. I'm with Navair for Weapons Division at China Lake. I'm also an alumni from here and uh, from 2012. I was also Dr. Benavides. Sorry, sir. I'm Dr. Benavides' research assistant for a year. So. I'm Scott Blue. I'm retired Air Force. Worked 35 years on military classified space programs. And I can't believe it. <laughs>
Finally, we came up on our critical design review where we pr presented our detailed design. This is the design that we moved forward with once we got approval for fabrication, testing, and ultimately validation. Here you can see the fabricated javelin system also displayed here in the front. There is an internal core, which is made up of aluminum and zorbethane, which is a damping material plates, as well as aluminum rods and polyethylene spacers. Of course, there is also the external body, which had to take the brunt of the force, seen on the table as well as on the um, counter there. The structure subsystem design was led by Haley Davis. The payload and power subsystem were in charge of determining what instrumentation we wanted to include. You can see we have a wide variety, such as a magnetic <coughs> vibration sensor, GPS. The majority of these instruments were housed in a payload box, seen here, as well as in the middle of the internal core, shown here. It can also be seen that there are some exter uh, external instrumentation, such as the magnetometer, which had to be out there due to the magnetic, sorry, due to the mag metallic, is the correct word, um, structure that it was inserted into. Finally, the communication subsystem. We included, I would like to take a moment and apologize, Tyler Bates is in charge of the pillar and power subsystem. I don't want to hold anyone short for that. Um, communication subsystem was led by Ashley Whiteman. And that included an XP transceiver, a monopole antenna, and a ton of coding. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to hand out the presentation to Haley Davis to discuss the structure's subsystem requirements. Thank you, Joshua. As you stated, my name is Haley Davis, and I'm the structure subsystem team lead. I'm joined here today by team members Brenda Becker and Nathan Hall. I will be discussing the structure subsystem requirements, and following me will be Brenda Becker with the structure subsystem validation. The critical requirements of the structure system subsystem were that the structure subsystem shall support all other subsystems and protect all other subsystems from damage during a minimum of a 510G impact. It shall also maintain the desired orientation of the system with an accuracy of plus or minus 15 degrees. The performance metrics that we analyzed in order to validate these requirements were ultimate compressive strength the deceleration distance and the impact angle. And the tests that we used to analyze these requirements were compression tests and a drive test. In order to evaluate the ultimate compressive strength, we had to first calculate the expected load on the interior structure upon impact. We did that using the equation shown here and found out that the expected force on the interior structure upon impact was 2,295 pounds force. From here, we, as you can see, our interior structure okay. is a tiered subsystem um, that is made up of uh, poly low density polyethylene spacers, aluminum plates, and sorbethane dampeners. The spacers are used to keep the plates of the interior core separated, and for this reason, we'll be taking the majority of the force of impact. We used this information to find the cross-sectional area of four spacers and divided the expected force by this area in order to find the maximum stress on the spacers upon impact. We found this to be 4,000 PSI, which can be compared to the published values of low-density polyethylene, which range between 3,100 and 6,100 PSI. In order to validate this performance metric, we performed a compression test, in which we used the United Compression Tester mounted four low-density polyethylene spacers between the compression plates and applied compressive loads of up to 3,000 pounds force. We saved all the data to this test to Microsoft Excel for future analysis. Our next performance metric, deceleration distance, was analyzed using the equation of motion shown here. We determined that the most critical subsystem component was the payload box, as it held components of both the payload and communications subsystems. The payload and power subsystem <laughs> tested the payload box and found it had an ultimate compressive strength of 500 pounds force. It also weighed less than one pound force. For this reason, the maximum deceleration it was able to undergo was 500 Gs. We used this value along with the impact velocity calculated by the integration team and found that a deceleration distance of 9.3 inches was required for the payload box to survive. 
From this, we subtracted the estimated penetration depth, also calculated by the integration team, and found that the interior structure was required to contribute 0.3 inches of deceleration distance. We tested this using a dampening compression test. Once again, we used the United Compression Tester, but this time we mounted the entire interior core between the plates of the compression tester. As you can see here, and in this image, our interior structure, as mentioned earlier, is made of aluminum plates, low-density polyethylene spacers, and our dampening material, sorbethane. A compressive load was applied to the interior core until buckling began to occur. At this point, the test was stopped and all data was saved for future analysis. Our final performance metric was impact angle. This was numerically validated using the simplified pitch moment equation, shown here, which was the basis for our dynamic model in Simulink. We also modeled wind disturbance based off of the apparent wind equation shown here. And using these two equations in our Simulink model, we were able to plot the penetrator's pitch versus time in this graph. This graph shows a drop angle of 15 degrees, and you can see that within three quarters of a second, the penetrator corrects itself to 12 degrees. We chose to highlight this time because during our validation test, we dropped the penetrator from a height of 10 feet, which correlates to a time of about three quarters of a second. So we would expect it to correct to 12 degrees by the time it impacted. Our validation test was a free fall test where we lift, lifted the penetrator to a height of 10 feet. The setup for this test can be shown here. You can see we have a team member holding the javelin penetrator and two team members holding the ladder for safety considerations. We set up a camera for video recording and dropped the penetrator with initial orientations of zero degrees and 15 degrees. And the videos were retrieved for future analysis. As you can see, we have a background grid. This background grid includes lines with the optimal orientation of the penetrator, as well as 15 degrees from this optimal orientation. The background grid was used to analyze both the initial drop angle and the impact angle. At this time, I would like to pass it off to Brenda Becker with the Structure, Substance, and Validation. Thank you, Haley. Like Haley stated, I'm Brenda Becker, and I'll be going over the Structure, Substance, and Validation. For our first test, like Haley stated, we did a compression test where we, uh, where the four LDPE spacers were required to survive about 2,300 pounds force, and we tested under a 3,000 pound force load condition. And as can be seen here, and this diagram, this is the setup of our spacers and with one inch apart here and here. And this is a top down view of our LDPE spacers. The hole in this section represents the hollowness of the spacers for this test. With that, as you can see, buckling occurred at about 4,500 PSI. And this buckling uh, occurs, uh, corresponds to about a 2,600 pound force. And this is found from the stress equation as described by Haley earlier. And due to this being about, 20, about 300 pounds force more than our uh, required uh, value of force that the spacers needed to survive, we obviously uh, we the requirement the requirement sorry about that the requirement was validated with this test to help improve some of the to help improve this test. If we decided to take this project further, is to increase the sample size of our test as well as better representing the cross section as. In this test, we didn't have any uh, threaded, threaded glass going through the cross-section of the LDPE spacers, and if we did this another time, we'd like to represent that in this test. After that, we did a dampening compression test where we had to, where the internal core had to uh, reduce the G-loading to under 500 Gs, and to do this, the core compression had to be about 0.3 inches of displacement in this test. Buckling started to occur at about 500 uh, pounds force, as seen in this graph here. And this 500 pounds force corresponds to about 0.33 inches of displacement. And with that, um, and with that, that corresponds to a G-log decrease of about 10 Gs, where the internal core will take about 498 Gs uh, in this test. And because the 498 Gs was below our 500 G limit, our requirement, our requirement was validated with this test. To improve this test, we could simulate the impact drop conditions instead of slowly applying the load as was done here. Finally, we did a free fall test where we dropped our penetrator at zero, at zero and 15 degree orientations. For all 10 trials at the zero degree orientation, it maintained its optimal orientation as seen here. 
this picture. And for a 15 degree orientation drop angle test, we found that out of all 10 trials that we did for where we started at 15 degrees, they maintained an average orientation of about 12.45 degrees with a maximum orientation of 15 degrees for one trial and a minimum of nine degrees orientation at penetration for another trial. Uh, while the gentleman did not correct to what we expected at 12 degrees in our numerical analysis, they still maintained the 15 degrees orientation as was our requirement. So our requirement was validated with this test. To help improve some of uh, the results is that we can increase the drop height to about 10% of our expected uh, drop, actual drop that we would drop with our balloon test, at, so at 40 feet, as well as der help derive a method to elim eliminate some of the human error that occurred uh, during the test when we were driving the penetrator at a set height and angle. With that, as you can see, all three of our requirements were validated with our three tests as shown here. And with that, I would like to hand it off to Teller Bates with payload and power source system requirements. Thank you, Brendan. Once again, my name is Tyler Bates, and I'll be discussing the payload and power, otherwise known as P2, system requirements. Presenting with me today is team member Walker Heron. And you will be discussing the subsystem validation. Also present with me, with me today is team member Michael Howell. So at this point, I would like to go over the subsystem requirements and objectives. The first two requirements pertain to the subsystem's cost and weight, and will be covered at a later point in the presentation. Our third requirement is that the subsystem shall provide a minimum of seven volts for the duration of the mission. Our five objectives are to collect magnetic field data, vibration data, acceleration data, temperature data, and positional data. The distinguishing factor between a requirement and objective is that a requirement must be experimentally validated to, in order to ensure it is a success, whereas objectives do not. Originally, these five objectives were requirements during the preliminary design phase. However, due to constraints with our budgets, time, and technical knowledge, it was later decided to reclassify these as objectives. This leads me to my only our subsystem's only performance metric, which is to ensure that the battery array will provide a minimum of seven volts for the duration of the mission which was projected to be about 90 minutes. This leads me to, excuse me, sorry. This was being accomplished by conducting a power duration test. This leads me to this slide, which was utilized to determine the potential depth of discharge that we would expect. This chart was generated under the assumptions that all the electrical components were drawing their maximum rate of current while operating at their minimum required voltage and being used at a constant rate. Altogether, our components would utilize about 1.8 watts of power. This leads to a total energy draw over the course of 90 minutes of about 2.5 watt hours. During our trade studies, during our preliminary design phase, it was determined to use alkaline batteries due in part to their reliability as well as their cost. Utilizing five CSO batteries in series yields about 7.5 volts nominally, which would be exceeding our minimum required voltage. Each battery has about a capacity of about 3,000 milliwatt, excuse me, milliamp hours, which leads to a total supply of energy of just over 22 and a half watt hours. Altogether, we expect to see a depth of discharge from one power duration test of just under 12%, which implies that we should be able to conduct multiple four-range tests while maintaining the capacity requirements. At this point, I'd like to pass out the presentation to Walker Herring to talk about the subsystem validation. Thank you, Tyler. As you stated, my name is Walker Herring, and I'll be going to the payload power subsystem validation. So once again, our only critical requirement was that we could provide these seven volts for a full 90 minute duration. Initially, after soldering the batteries together, we measured an output voltage of 8.2 volts. The reason why this was higher than expected is 7.5 volts, is because the solder heated up the batteries, affecting their internal chemistry, causing them to output a higher voltage. Immediately before the test, we measured the output voltage to be 7.39 volts, which was its steady state voltage and room temperature. And immediately after the 90-minute duration test, we measured 6.9 volt output, which was less than the seven required, failing the critical requirement. At a later date, we measured the voltage again to be 7.2 volts, and after looking into this voltage increase, we discovered it was due to something called voltage recovery, which occurs after usage of the batteries to recover to another steady state voltage output. Future improvements, if we were to continue this project, would be to look into additional power sources so we can meet all requirements. So because we are not able to provide seven volts for full 90 minute duration, we failed our critical requirement. During a power duration test, however, we were able to 
successfully test all of our objectives of collecting various types of data and saving it with the use of the following devices. Uh, the accelerometers shown here is our hydro accelerometer and low accelerometer. The hydro accelerometer completes the objective of collecting deceleration data. It is a piezoelectric accelerometer with a range of plus or minus 2,000 Gs and a resolution of plus or minus 10 Gs. The low G accelerometer completes the objective of requiring vibration data as a range of plus or minus 8 Gs and a resolution of plus or minus 0.01 Gs. The magnetometer, which is shown here, completes the requirement of requiring magnetic field data as a range of plus or minus 8 Gauss and a resolution of plus or minus 0.01 Gauss. And note that Earth's magnetic field strength is 0.5 Gauss, so it can detect magnetic north. We also used four or five NTC thermistors, which stands for negative temperature coefficient thermistors, shown here are four of them. Uh, they were calibrated using the Steinhardt Hart equation, shown here, in the cold chamber or chiller. And they completed the shift of requiring thermistor data, temperature data. And finally, our global positioning system comes in two parts, the GPS ceramic antenna, which goes on the back cap, and the GPS receiver, which goes inside the payload box, completes the objective of acquiring positional data. <coughs> It can give an accuracy of 8.2 feet and gives us latitude, longitude, and altitude. So during a power duration test, we were able to complete these objectives and successfully collect data on that. With that, I'd like to pass it off to Ashley Wyman to discuss the communication system. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Walker. As Walker stated, my name is Ashley Weidman and I'm the team lead for communications. I'm joined here today by my teammate, Leah Sanfilippo. And today I will be discussing the communication subsystem design, and Leah will be continuing that conversation with our validation. Our communication subsystem was designed on the following requirements, which includes that we shall have a communication range of 400 feet, which is the estimated height that we would be dropping our balloon from. We also have that our link budget will be 12 decibels at range, which accounts for a signal strong enough in order to encounter as little bit error rate as possible. We also have that our payload and ground station will on, excuse me, operate under one watt and five volts at our range. In order to validate that our communication subsystem met all of these requirements, we evaluated them based on the following performance metrics, which includes the transmission range and the received signal at range, which were validated using our transmission range test. We also validated that our communication subsystem operated under one watt and five volts by measuring the voltage and current that was supplied to the transceiver, um, excuse me, which was validated using the power test. Before we conducted our transmission range test, we verified that we were able to have 12 decibels at range, which was validated using the link budget equation shown here which is also known as our energy per bit to density noise ratio equation, which is basically a sum of all the gains and losses that our signal would, uh, excuse me, have during <coughs> our transmission. In order to validate that this was correct, we conducted our transmission range test. We measured the output from our RSSI pin, which is our receive signal indicator pin, which is provided by our XB transceiver. It is a ratio of the duration of the pulse at that pin for 200 microseconds. And since it is output as a ratio, we have to convert that ratio to a signal and then subtract the ambient noise floor, which was estimated to be negative 95 decibels from that signal to get our link budget. This needed to be under 12 decibels at range, which we believed was possible due to the transceiver's rating to operate over half a mile. Our actual transmission range test was conducted out at the lower Embry-Riddle fields, which are, is seen here. We measured 500 feet between our transmitter and our receiver, since that would be the length of our tether used for our drop test, in order to keep a safety radius, which will be discussed later. We had our transmitter over here and our receiver over here. 
And we started the transmitter over by our receiver and then slowly walked over to this location, which was roughly 500 feet. We measured the output from our transceiver, which was our RSSI data, using a serial monitor and logged it using the program PuTTY. And then we received a small string, which was just the symbol A, every two seconds to verify that we were still receiving data as we were conducting our test. And finally, our power test was simply conducted by measuring the current and voltage that was being supplied to our transceiver. We were using a simple A-ping as well between our transceivers in order to verify this. We measured the current and voltage in order to estimate the power which is seen here. And now I'd like to pass it off to Leo San Filippo to discuss our validation. Thank you, Ashley. Again, my name is Leah Sanfilippo, and I'll be discussing the validation of the communication subsystem. Now, Ashley just discussed all the, the equations that we use for our link budget, and you can see those put in the graphical form right here. At 400 feet, we received a link budget of about 22 decibels, which is important because that meets our 12 decibel requirement that we had stated earlier. When we actually did our range test, you can see that our link budget was much different than the link budget that we had calculated. The difference between this graph and the previous graph that you just saw is that this shows our link budget in relation to time instead of distance. So it looks a little different. And you can see that at the first peak of our data, we received a link budget of about 56 to 58 decibels. This is a lot higher than what we expected to receive at about 250 feet, which we estimated that we had been transceiving at at that specific spot. You can see after that peak though, we did, our data went down to about, about zero decibels or negative decibels again, and that was while we were receiving zero RSSI data. This is because we encountered an obstruction on the field that we were testing at as we passed by a light post and we began to receive more noise and signal. After this though, we, after we passed by the light post, we did begin to, we hit a peak again with our data. And you can also see that we began to receive lower data in this. This is because we changed the orientation of our antenna on our ground station. Um, when we were getting the higher data, it was because the antenna was pointing towards our payload from our ground station. And as we oriented it away, we began to receive lower decibels in our link budget. This is important because it shows that orientation, your trade, the orientation of your antenna does affect the signal that you're receiving. Finally, we did our voltage and our power test, and we compared it to data that we had received from the, um, the data sheets of our transceivers. As you can see, our power estimation was much different than the actual power, and that was because our current that we had received from the data sheets was much higher than the actual current we were operating at. The current was much lower because we were only sending one ping at a time during operation, instead of the full maximum data that we could have been sending. Our voltage, act, voltage, though, was about the same as the voltage as estimation, which was good. Finally, we validated most of our requirements. Um, the only requirement we were not able to validate was our link budget requirement, and that was because during the, the range test that we were operating, um, we only got, we got a lot of zero RSSI data, which showed that, and that was because of the obstruction and just the beginning of the test which brought our average link budget down to about 10.98 decibels instead of above the 12 decibels that we were looking for. I'd now like to pass it off to Nicholas Smith to, to discuss the jamming system requirements. Thank you, Leah. As Leah stated, I am Nicholas Smith, and I'll be discussing the Javelin system requirements. Joining me today as part of the integration team is our assistant project manager and lead integrator, Dottie Bluejuice, the Structure Subsystem Integrator, Connor Warren, the Communication Subsystem Integrator, Jess McKenna, and another Power and Payload Subsystem Integrator, Jaron Freilich. At the system level, Javelin has four total requirements. However, the first requirement pertains to the budget, and I'll allow our project manager, Josh Griffin, to allude to that later on in this presentation. The second requirement pertains to the overall allowable weight of Javelin, and the last two requirements are more than safe, for safety than anything else. The third requirement pertains to the allowable wind gust conditions during testing, and the final requirement pertains to the allowable horizontal displacement between Javelin's drop point and impact point during the test. Here you can see a breakdown of each of the design, 
excuse me, each of these desired requirements I just mentioned with the performance metric we utilized in the middle column to test and analyze those requirements. Now the validation method that we utilized to test each of those requirements are listed here in the far right column. There was only two tests conduction, conducted, excuse me, a final weight test and a balloon drop test. Now at the system level, there are additional performance metrics that were required to be analyzed and tested in addition to those that were just mentioned. These specific performance metrics do not relate to a specific system level requirement, however they are necessary for the subsystems to have completed their work. For example, the maximum G-loading requirement here was required to be analyzed, tested, and determined at the system level for the structure subsystem to determine, analyze, and test their G-loading survivability requirement at the subsystem level. Here you can see a breakdown of all these system level performance metrics, both those that pertain to a specific system level requirement and those that do not. In the middle column is the analysis method we utilize to analyze each of those metrics, and in the far right, the testing method to test each of those metrics. Now for the weight metric, we analyzed in CATIA and tested with a final system weight test, and for all the remaining metrics in the far left column, we analyzed by the results of numerically integrating two different equations of motion in MATLAB. One equation of motion for the drop portion of the test that Josh alluded to earlier, and one equation of motion for the penetration portion. And for those same metrics, we conducted our final balloon drop test. This is the drop equation of motion assumptions. This equation of motion initially made three critical assumptions. The first assumption made was that Javelin is a smooth, solid cylinder, and by smooth, we simply mean that we neglected the presence of the four aerodynamic fins. We assumed Javelin's nose to be pointing towards the end of the Earth, center of the Earth, excuse me, at all times, and initially, the equation of motion you're about to see on the next slide neglected wind gusts. Now, some of the terms in the same equation of motion are defined in the radial, tangential, and normal directions of Javelin, as seen in this figure here to the right. This is the drop equation of motion. Now, we know she's not the prettiest equation in the world, but it's not all about the looks, right? <laughs> so some of the non constant <coughs> terms, excuse me, in this equation are the position of Javelin with respect to the center of the Earth, the atmospheric density, which is a function of altitude, and the true airspeed or relative wind velocities in the radial, tangential, and normal direction of Javelin, respectively. For the penetration equation of motion, several assumptions were also made. Our target soil was assumed to be uniform. In other words, there is no layering of different types of soil. We assumed our target soil would not be frozen. We assumed Javelin to be a rigid body. And this equation of motion you're about to see also neglected the moisture content of the soil. Now for this specific equation of motion, the positive direction is defined as that direction directly below our target surface. This is the penetration equation of motion. This equation of motion was developed in the 70s by the US Army based on experimentally obtained data by Sandia National Laboratories in the 60s. Sandia National Laboratories in the 60s conducted 47 low speed projectile impact tests. Now by low speed impact, we're referring to impact velocities less than 80 meters per second, which equates to an approximate 262 feet per second in English units. This brings us to our final overall system weight and balloon drop test. For the weight metric, as I alluded to earlier, we utilize a weight test, and for all the other metrics, we performed a balloon drop test. This balloon drop test included a 3 kilogram helium filled balloon and a burn wire mechanism to remotely release javelin from the balloon as we attempted to reach our target altitude of 400 feet. Now when we actually performed the test, we only re reached excuse me, an altitude of approximately 322 feet. We also utilized three tethers which can be vaguely seen here, here, and here in the image in order to control the ascent of javelin and to reel the balloon back in once javelin was released. We performed this test on the field between Haas Boulevard and Daubertine Drive on Embry Riddle at the campus here, which can be seen in this image. So if one was to make a left on the Willow Creek Road from the 89 in this direction and travel this way, this is the first Embry Riddle main entrance you would encounter to your right. This road here is Haas Boulevard, this road is Daubertine Drive, and this is the approximate location where we performed our balloon drop test. With that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Connor Warren to discuss Javelin System Validation. Thank you, Nick. As Nick said, my name is Connor Warren, and I'll be walking you guys through the Javelin system validation and showing you guys a quick video at the end of our test. So to begin with, from our experiment, we measured wind speed at the actual test of zero miles per hour. Now, if you remember, correct, if you remember from what Nick said, that was a requirement of our test because we dropped less than five miles per hour. Uh, we also had a final weight of 20.8 pounds uh, in the final model, and our GPS data was unfortunately missing because the GPS disconnected during assembly. Now, some additional performance metrics that Nick also mentioned were our impact speed, which was about 97 miles per hour, uh, our penetration depth, which was 9.4 inches, which can be seen on this model right there, and our max G, uh, 
loading information, which is also missing, which I'll talk to you about in the next slide. So, our instrumentation summary. Pre-impact, all our components were functional. And I mean all of them. We conducted subsystem tests that proved it. Uh, our GPS, though, was disconnected during assembly, and we didn't notice it until after the test, unfortunately. Post-impact, our magnetometer, which is one of the instrumentations on here on the back cap, was hit by the carabiner that connected the javelin to the balloon. The damage to the magnetometer caused the main program to freeze, so everything was still functional, but it was no longer collecting data, unfortunately. And this data collection was also confirmed by the micro SD card. Communications was also lost during the drop as a result, but once we removed the damaged magnetometer, everything still worked. So, for our weight test, our CATIA model showed that our javelin should have weighed 21.6 pounds. Now we found this by applying a density to each component and then multiplying by the volume of each component and then summing all the, that up. The experimental model was a little lighter, 20.8 pounds. The difference is believed to be due to inaccurately modeled components and higher densities uh, applied to the CATIA models. We did es conservative estimates on the higher end because we had a very strict uh, weight limit. Uh, wind speed, we simulated up less than five miles per hour. We measured zero miles per hour using an anemometer, excuse me, anemometer, <laughs> measurement every two minutes. And we also released pilot balloons and just watched them float up, and they didn't drift very far. Drift between the drop and impact points, as I said, we could not validate this because we stopped collecting data, or excuse me, because the GPS disconnected during the test. Penetration depth. Using our simulations that we had already generated, we should have only penetrated 7.5 inches into the soil. We actually penetrated 9.4 inches. We think this is due to a more penetrable soil. Our max G loading, as I said, could not be verified because of the magnetometer damage and our impact speed was estimated for our drop height of about 320 feet. So we just used simple physics equations to show we hit at about 97 miles per hour. So what have we validated? We validated our weight requirement. We validated our, our wind speed. We did not validate though our horizontal displacement though, unfortunately, because of the loss of the GPS. So some potential improvements we could do in the future. We could add a pre-flight verification step to verify that the GPS is connected. We could also conduct worst case scenario tests. What if the magnetometer is damaged? What if the GPS is damaged? How does that affect the rest of the system? And with that, I'd like to show you guys a quick video of the balloon drop. See there is the balloon, there's the javelin, there's the tethers. Launch. And we successfully hit the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, I'd like to hand it off to Donnie Blue Juice to talk about configuration management.
And so you can see here, if there's two links in each box, the first link is the bill of materials. The bill of materials uh, is a list of all the parts in that particular subassembly. Each part has a unique part number. That way later on, different teams can come back and use that, or reference that part number and no one else has claimed it. Each part number, or each part number for each part is a description of the dimensions of the part and also where we, if we were to purchase the parts from, if at all. Next is a description of the parts. And then the last columns is how many of the parts are we used for that subassembly. The second link down is the instructions on how to assemble that subassembly. You can see here, I know this kind of seems a lot on the slide, but there is an image of the javelin, and here the little text is instructions on how to put the javelin subassembly together. There's also a title block down here that gives a brief, in our brief overview of what the subassembly is. Also page numbers and part numbers for that subassembly. So once we have all the parts put together, which we use CATIA for, we then created a drawing, which assisted in creating a more simplified explanation of how to assemble everything. And go into more detail for one of the computer subassemblies, we need to make sure that all the components were in the computer subassembly and that the computer subassembly can stand alone without having to interact with any of the other subassemblies. The computer subassembly contains all the parts you see up here. And then once you combine all of it, it creates another, you create another drawing to explain how the computer subassembly gets assembled fully. We also made sure, or sorry, we also had a bill of materials for the computer subassembly, similar to the Javelin subassembly. So once we had the bill of materials and the instructions fully completed, we then created a drawing of the top-down view to make sure that when we fully assembled it, which you can see to the right, it matches perfectly with the CATIA model. As you can see, it pretty much does. So currently we're done. Our, there's a binder all the way over there. It's completed. All of the parts are printed out, and the instructions are printed out as well. We have 126 part we, parts we used to create the Javelin Pro, but because we replicated some parts, there's only 60 unique parts. And then there are a total of seven subassemblies that were combined to create the Javelin. With that, I'd like to pass it off to Joshua Griffin to conclude with the management. Thank you, Dottie. Once again, my name is Joshua Griffin. I'll be talking about some management items. First, I'd like to discuss the labor hours of the Infinite Division 2. As you can see in this gray portion right here, sorry, um, professional development, 2,075 hours, approximately 45% of all the time that we spent starting from September 22nd of last year. That is time that we spent in class working on this project. The other four categories, um, our time spent outside of class working on the project. Most notably, engineering, which is time spent individually, and technical time spent working in groups of two or more. Management is a section that is only contributed by myself and Dania Blue Juice as the assistant project manager. Administration is time spent editing documents and preparing presentations such as this one. At the beginning of last semester, we were awarded $1,700 from Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. From there, we also sought out eight additional financial sponsors that donated a total of $850, giving us a total project budget of $2,550 for us to use for both the system uh, fabrication as well as for the testing of our system. This also becomes our first system level requirement remaining within that $2,550 budget. To the date, we have spent only $2,311, giving us a remainder of $240. Uh, this means that the validation of that first requirement was a success. Moving into structures budget, each subsystem has its own budget, and that is their first and primary requirement. The uh, structures budget is $690 mentioned here, and can be represented in this blue column here. As you can see, just barely scraped by with $684, we did purchase all of our items from the vendor McMaster Card. Moving on to our payload and powers requirement. They had a budget of $540 represented here, and they did a uh, noticeably better job of staying in, under the budget, but it's not a contest. 
Um, <laughs> as you can see here, it says times two for all of our instrumentation. We did jump at the opportunity to build two full systems, each one costing about a total of $672. And that is uh, because we originally intended to do two drop tests. Um, for reasons, basically for safety concerns, we weren't able to conduct those two tests because of wind conditions, which was, if you remember, one of our system level requirements remaining under five miles per hour. Moving on to our communication subsystem budget, we have $170 total, and they were $2 under, so they get a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> the testing budget did not have a requirement. Essentially, anything that was left over was dedicated to testing. We had a projected budget of $1,000 for testing, and we actually came in under that at 918. Um, that is because we had overestimated for like shipping costs for materials. The balloon itself was costing $400, so that right there was kind of discouraging when we were first looking at the budget. Going into our milestone schedule, I put all these milestones here because they are all green because they were co completed on time. The concept document requirement and both of our detail and critical design reviews were accomplished on time, allowing us to begin fabrication at the time that we were supposed to. Moving on from there, we hit problems. Um, <laughs> we started out 17 days behind schedule with, uh, when we finally finished our fabrication. From there, we incrementally um, improved and our last uh, delayed milestone was our final configuration management, and that was about a week late. After that, we finished our system testing on time, and from then on, we have been on course. Lessons learned. <laughs> Teamwork. Um, in engineering, you can't accomplish anything on your own. No matter how smart you are, no matter how talented you are, you will always rely on someone else to support you and to help you complete your objectives. And this is something we have learned um, time and time again over the last two semesters. Communication. This is, <laughs> um, this, this lesson is not just between the team members, though it did cause complications over the last uh, couple semesters. Um, and some issues that we did run into could have been resolved. But this also applies to our communication between us and vendors, which we did run into some issues with some of our high GXL rounders due to a lack of communication with our vendor, um, DigiKey. We are not expected to know everything, and we learned that quite strongly this last two semesters. At um, a different time, probably every class, uh, someone on the team came back and just came back from a professor and was trying to explain what they talked to him about, and they're like, I think I understand it, and then 30 minutes later, they're going back to that professor and asking another question. Um, it's not the fact that we need to know it, it's the fact that we, can, we have the capability and the uh, perseverance to learn it. And finally, staying on that same note of perseverance, you are going to encounter problems. What makes us engineers, or what will make us engineers upon graduation, is the fact that we can overcome it. The Infinis Division would like to extend their gratitude to these individuals, most notably Dr. Julio Benavides and Dr. Angela Beck, for their mentorship over the last two semesters. We'd also like to note these two, these individuals as well. At this time, I'd like to open up the floor for questions, primarily from the panelists, and if time should allow, from the audience as well.
Okay, this equation up here was used. So we had an impact <coughs> velocity, which was calculated by our integration team. And then we had, oh, the 500 Gs. The payload box had an ultimate compressive strength of 500 pounds, and it weighed less than one pound. So with a, a deceleration of greater than 500 Gs, it would fail. So okay. um, did you take into account like any of the payload that you're carrying? Like you had a lot of electronics and a lot of sensors. Mm -hmm. could, could all of those withstand 500 Gs, or were you just designing based on the, the box? We tried to design to the payload components. The reason we were most worried about the payload box was because it housed most of the, the majority of the payload components. And the rest of the payload components were on the end of the back cap. So the deloading would be significantly dampened by that point. So the payload box itself was the most, most likely to fail on impact. Okay, thank you. I had another question regarding the, the batteries. Um, you didn't meet the power requirements because you ended up soldering and, and changing some of the performance of the battery. Did you um, come up with any other ways that you could have you know, still supplied power without soldering the batteries? Yeah, I will uh, defer that question to Tyler Bates. Thank you, Josh. Well, the, the idea that started the batteries was actually advised to us by other professors and if we were to not solder it, that would mean we would have to use some sort of like clip-on mechanism and then possibly epoxy them together. And because of the fact that we're using C-cell batteries and they don't have clips that are very user-friendly in that sense, so we decided to go ahead and solder it. An alternative solution that we could have done is using nine volt batteries in parallel instead, because those you can clip into and you can epoxy the clips. And it would, using six in parallel, you would be able to provide as much capacity but nine volts instead. So that would be a future improvement if we were to improve it in the future. <laughs> True words have never been said. <laughs> did you, I, um, talking about the transmission test results, did you go back and, and try and repeat the test once you noticed that, I noticed the data that you had plotted had an obvious like a light pole structure. Did you repeat that and, and report the data in the open field or, or see? Um, due to time constraints, we weren't able to repeat the test, unfortunately, because we didn't notice that we had obstructions in our signal until we were writing our final test report. Excellent question for Ashley. 
Uh, we got that from a published source. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but uh, the noise floor uh, generally ranged from 80 decibels to 95 decibels, uh, negative decibels, and so we decided to go with negative, ne excuse me, negative 95 decibels with our noise floor. Did you, did you look at any, uh, any thermal sources or, or any of the EMI, like EMC coming off of the electronics in your, in your uh, system? Uh, unfortunately, we did not. Okay. Because that would all factor into your, your noise floor calculations so that you can truly figure out what your link budget is. Uh, because obviously when you did the, the analysis, you said you had a 22 dB as, as your link budget. Yes. from the analysis, but when you did it, you obviously didn't get the experimental result. So did you look at things like antenna patterns, you know, to try and figure out what the test, because um, you, you just took the antenna and walked away from the receiver, right? Yes. Okay, so antenna patterns are huge for data. So, um, you know, you're talking about turning the antenna and going in different directions, and that's going to make a huge sneaks into our lives and, and kind of takes over. So just think about that kind of stuff. Um, I would say that you guys did a great job um, explaining uh, derived system level requirements. And that you have a list of requirements on a piece of paper, you go through and you check all of them and then some people stop there. But some requirements actually apply others and then apply things back up the chain of the system level. So you guys did a really great job. Of coming up with those. Um, that being said, did you guys ever go back and look at any of your requirements and and kind of uh, maybe analyze them for things like suitability, utility? You know, did you go back to the requirements at the end and say, if you passed or you failed it, is the requirement meaningful? Um, so that that analysis is not something that we structurally did as a team, um, cohesive, as a cohesive unit. Um, though every time we gather, it's always like, oh, we could have done this, we could have done this. So um, a, a formal analysis of that, no. Such Things such as uh, the power duration test. Uh, Tyler, what is the minimum that the voltage of the mega is? The uh, microcontroller requires a minimum of six volts to operate properly, so as a factor of safety, we would add it in a volt. And so things like that of, okay, well, yes, we had a requirement of seven volts. Was that, um, even though, yes, we should have a factor of safety, was that appropriate? And we've, we've had those conversations as a team. Um, okay. But so not, not, as a, not as a formal analysis of our results. So, yeah, you're going down the right path, but, like, your, I think your power draw requirement, you came up with, like, 1.8 watts. Yes. And you said that was from everything running at its max draw at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where I'm saying, is that a realistic definition of your requirement? Oh, I'm you sure. know, trying to go back to the numerical bit. Right. Condition. Take what your customer says, like I want this, and then you have to be smart enough as an engineer to go back and say, no, what you really mean is this, and it will save you money if you go to So just things like that. You guys did a great job. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So they touched on a couple of, of uh, questions. No, that's fine. <laughs> just quick then. Um, so structural is the question I had first. Um, was there any structural analysis that you guys performed? Because I see a lot of testing and verification. Um, I think that would be important to see alongside that when we were going to do validation and verification for the practice. Uh, short answer, yes. Long answer from the other days. Nate, can you take us to slide 108? You performed a number of analyses in ANSYS and as well as SOLIDWORKS. Um, we would have included them in the slides, but we were a little concerned about time. But we, um, we applied a fine medium and coarse mesh to the CATIA model. We chose to use the fine mesh because all the values came out similarly. And we applied a a force to the tip of the nose cone 
and apply the fixed support to the end of the penetrator. We did not have the capabilities initially to form a dynamic model, so we had to use a static structural model. And then, um, we had a force of 11,730 pounds force, and that was derived from our estimated deceleration of 510 Gs, as well as the estimated weight of the entire system. And then we were able to analyze the normal forces or normal stresses on the penetrator and the shear stresses. Some of the weaknesses with our ANSYS model though was it treated the entire system as a bonded system so it didn't take into account how the spacers would move or um, I guess how, how the structure would come up against the locking plate. It didn't take into account a number of, of uh, items. So there's a number of assumptions made. We also we're able to, Nate, if you take us to slide 116, I believe it is. a dynamic model in ANSYS. So we were able to teach ourselves from a number of YouTube videos how to um, how to model our system in ANSYS to create a dynamic model. However, again, a number of assumptions went into this because we had limited experience. If we had more time, we would like to um, make this a little bit more of an accurate representation. But, no, it's good to see that um, all of this that you took it into consider consideration uh, maybe just starting in the presentation, you know, the, the results of the numbers and your verification tables can be helpful. Um, on a more general note, what design considerations did you guys take in mind when you decided to keep the, the end of your uh, design method and your components uh, exposed? Um, okay, so if I understand the question correctly, why do we have things sticking out in the back? Yeah. Got it. Um, so generally, it, it was all because of the metallic structure and how it affected the instruments, such as the magnetometer. Um, having that inside of a metallic structure throws that completely out the window, and it's um, at that point just fancy stuff inside. Um, the GPS antenna, as well as the communications mon monocle, um, have similar uh, needs to be exposed. Additionally, we, we had the back cap um, in, it was a component that was added to the overall design to provide uh, a, a distance and a protection from the metallic structure for those components in particular. And uh, from there we just built onto it, adding the thermistor for exterior temperature data. Um, so it just kind of evolved from that. The one thing though, the night before our system level test, um, putting everything together and then tying the, you look at the locking plate, there are holes and that's what we tied string to and that's how it was um, attached to the balloon. That string went up and was attached to the burn wire. Um, and at the end of that string was a metal uh, ring along with a, the carabiner. And uh, what we didn't take into consideration until the night before is that that carabiner is going to come crashing straight into the back of that. And as uh, on side 161 you'll see the results of, oh, well, you see the carabiner the yeah. on the next 162. And so you can see uh, a couple of cracks as well as into the um, wiring as well. So that was a last minute um, realization that we had made a uh, big overlook or something. Okay. So it had been enclosed in some capacity possibly Correct. Just a lesson learned there. Just a lesson learned. As I mentioned earlier, the test was $1,000, so there's no second chance <laughs> in that case. Thank you very much. Just wanted to echo that sentiment. And very nice job. For some of you remember, I was very skeptical of this project last semester. And we need that to require that we want all the concerns. Um, really, uh, the main question I had was over the, uh, the second test that got canceled, because uh, you mentioned you both two right. systems for testing. Um, 
you said that it was canceled because of safety concerns or revenue alone. Was the second test uh, supposed to be conducted sequentially on the same day, or were you going to test at a different time? Yes. Um, so we don't, we don't have a video of how the operation of the actual test, because it, did, it, was, it would be like a 15 minute video. Um, essentially, once it was attached to the balloon, there was three tethers and there was tether bearing teams that were, walked away from our drop point, releasing the balloon. And after it was released, the balloon was recovered outside of our drop zone. Um, what we would have done, if we had been capable of doing it, is removed the javelin that system that was just dropped, and then bring the balloon back out and set up the test again using the same balloon. Um, yes. Um, once again, it's a $400 balloon, so we, we're not going to let it go and get another one. Um, so, yeah, the, the consideration that needed to be made, though, is that, um, I mean, it took us about 45 minutes to get the balloon and the system prepped on site, as well as an additional 10 to 15 minutes of raising it up. Um, and then when you add another 45 minutes of us recovering it and doing our own uh, observations about contaminating the landing site, um, by that time, uh, a lot of you are Embry Riddle, either students or alumni. Uh, April is a windy <laughs> month here, so it picked up pretty quickly as soon as we got into like a nine o'clock time frame. Okay. Um, really, the only other question I have is for the structures testing. And uh, I noticed you mentioned that you were looking at sustained compression mode. I was just wondering if you would take any opportunity to try and uh, test in forms of shock load, just to see if there is any differences in response. Ms. Haley, please. Okay, Nate, if you'll go to slide 142. We originally had a test plan where we would drop our, uh, we would have a drop mass on the drop tower shown here, and we had two accelerometers. One had a our sorbent name dampener under it, and so from that we were hoping to obtain how much. Um, in an impact situation, how much the sort of thing dampener would actually absorb. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete this test um, due to issues with the accelerometers. But that was the only shock test that we had uh, planned. Um, it's the only shock test that we had uh, the equipment for besides the pre-fall test that we, we talked about earlier. Thank you. I'm doing. I'm doing kind of <laughs> so overall, I said this to you guys before, I've been here for a couple of your presentations before. And <clears throat> overall your presentation was contractor level presentation. It was very well done. In fact, I've seen presentations for contractors <clears throat> that spent a whole lot more money than you did that wasn't anywhere in this business. So overall, very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things as you're going through the presentation that you have to be careful about is talking a little too fast. You tend to get in, when you're on the microphone, you tend to get a little bit of a hurry. So you want to be conscious about slowing down, you know, taking the time. Um, that's what makes a, a great presentation, a uh, good presentation. But overall, very, very good. Just a couple of questions. Um, the, Impact summary, the impact problem that you have or character is dropped. Um, you pointed out uh, something that you might have done or could have done, you know, as, as far as additional testing. And I want to point out to you that testing is the, your best friend. So at, at all times, when you have the opportunity, try a new testing that exactly simulates whatever the final event is that you're going to try and do. So some kind of a, you know, almost a uh, short drop test or something where you would have had the carabiner or something like that, you would have seen this uh, coming, and then you could have precluded that from happening as you make a demonstration. Obviously, you know, <clears throat> if this was an actual penetrator that was going to go somewhere not here, right in every room, this would have been a failure. If you spent all this time and effort, it would have been a failure. So you want to make sure that you design your test program to exactly simulate as best you can the conditions that you're going to incur at the final, you know, whatever the final event is or that you're going to be doing. And I saw that you did that, so that was a really good catch on your part. Thank you. Um, 
You talked about the, uh, was it the GPS that wasn't connected? It ended up not being connected? Correct. Again, that's another, that's another um, indication that you didn't do the right level system testing. There should have been some kind of test at the very, when you connected everything up that you verified that everything was working. Correct. So, you know, that's another, you know, kind of lesson learned. Yeah, one, one of the things that uh, we keep beating ourselves up over is uh, that <laughs> there are, thank you, Dr. Jenny, um, <laughs> is that uh, there is no such thing as being too prepared. Um, having a step-by-step -step procedure as, um, I mean, we took this thing apart, put it back together probably four or five times, and we thought we knew what we were doing, and uh, maybe a little bit of fatigue the night before the test, putting things together. It was something that was overlooked, and having a procedural element to that would have uh, prevented that. That was going to be my other question. That was not in the test plan to do some kind of check, and you just forgot to do it. To yeah, so we we end. turned it on. Um, so when the system is assembled and when it turns on, there's an LED. So when you, we turned it on, the LED worked. But I mean, it's a it's a black hole. What's going on inside? And we through all of our testing during the assembly as well as prior to the assembly, um, that light was what we were using as our signifier that it was working correctly. Um, and so it was what was available to us with our time not having um, the capability to maybe come up with other methods, maybe not cap capability, the, the time and um, resources to come up with other methods of verifying that everything was working. We did do such things as that once it was turned on, making sure we received communication packets. So we knew that um, what sensors were collecting data um, from that standpoint. But beyond you know, that, uh, Ashley would like to add to that. All right, so that was the main purpose of the communication subsystem was to make sure that all the sensors were working and data was being uh, collected. Unfortunately, due to some software uh, problems like uh, packet misalignment, we weren't able to check that everything was working. We were getting nonsense data for everything. We were getting data, but we just weren't getting uh, accurate enough data in order to make sure that everything was working. So this is not the first time I've seen something very simple cause problems. Uh, we've had actual spacecraft failures because of something just as simple as this. You lose the whole spacecraft because you can't communicate with it. I wish that's so, a skill. It's a, it's a very good one. <laughs> well, the reason I'm saying that is a very good lesson for her. Very good lesson for her. Anyway, that's, that's all I have. You guys did a great job. Thank you very much, sir.